Hello to all of you, our viewers. As always, it is a pleasure to welcome you to this latest edition of the News in English on Rwanda Television. My name is Serge Nhori. As always, we'll begin with the headlines. The results of the 2023-2024 academic year secondary school leaving national examinations have been announced here in Rwanda. Rwanda's Minister of Infrastructure has attended the 16th Council of Ministers meeting and visited the regional Rusumo Falls hydroelectric project. And on the international scene to the US and after losing to the White House, uh, pardon me, losing the White House to the former President Donald Trump, Democrats are soul searching to find out what went wrong. In the 2023-2024 academic year, 78.6% of students who sat for the national secondary school leaving exams scored over 50% out of the 91,713 students registered. Uh, that is 91,713 students who are registered. 91,298, that is 99.5, took the exams with 78.6 passing. This indicates a failure rate of up to 21.4%, a significant decline compared to last year's pass rate of over 90%. Measures are to be put in place to support students who did not pass their exams. Male students passed at a rate of 50.5%, while female students followed closely with a 49.5% pass rate. General education had a pass rate of 67.5%, whereas technical and vocational schools achieved a much higher pass rate of 96.1%. Now, some of the top performing students in the national exams attribute the success to self-confidence and the unwavering support of their parents throughout their education journey. Unlike previous years, where a single top student was recognized nationwide, the Ministry of Education awarded 18 students who excelled in their respective fields of study across all exam categories. This change brought immense joy to the students and their parents. I was very happy to hear that I'm among the best students who scored the best scores in the country. And it was my very pleasure to to win uh, like awards like this and I hope that I will continue studying. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good thing, it's a very good thing for me and my family also and uh, I can't be more happier than this. Yeah. The first thing uh, is uh, it's an admission to Rwanda Coding Academy. It's one of the, uh, the best schools, I can say, in the country. They give you all the resources, the computer, internet, uh, uh, top-level instructor, uh, instructors, and uh, everything is literally provided. So that's one of the things which helped me uh, succeed. Uh, my parents also helped me uh, both uh, in in many ways, you know, because uh, they are the ones who, who who give you advice, who encourages you when you are discouraged, who give you direction and uh, the fundamentals. You know. Now to the U.S., that is to the California State University in Sacramento that is hosting the 6th International Conference on Genocide with special sessions commemorating the 30 years since the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi here in Rwanda. Running from November the 14th to the 16th, the three-day event covers topics such as genocide, genocidal denial, ethnic cleansing and other atrocity crimes driven by genocidal ideologies. We have the details with Adam Squizera. This was reiterated at the 6th International Conference on Genocide held at Sacramento State University. Rwanda's Minister of Justice, Dr. Ujira Shewusha Emanuel, emphasized that commemorating the genocide against Tutsi ensures that future generations understand the truth and take responsibility to prevent such tragedy from ever happening again. Georgia Person affirmed this by stating that the world must learn from the history to secure a better future. We, we learn from history and genocide. I'm a genocide scholar, but I'm a historian. So I approach it from the past, but I believe that we can learn from the past. And you know, the, the never again of genocide, which has not yet happened, but can only happen if we learn from previous genocides. I look at 
youth indoctrination in Rwanda and I believe that by understanding how young people were indoctrinated and preconditioned to genocide, we can learn how to stop that happening in other countries to prevent future genocides, for example. Dr. Boyatamo Ati, one of the organizers of the International Conference on Genocide, highlighted Rwanda as a powerful example of a nation that emerged from darkness to become a model of unity and resilience. Discuss uh, what happened in Rwanda, we discuss what lessons can be learned from Rwanda. And then Rwanda is just an example of, uh, you know, a, 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 a nation that rose from ashes to be what it is. Um, they were able to, um, Rwanda is a country that was able to um, reconcile the differences and bring people together. It's an example, whether people believe it or not, but the, the, um, the evidence is, is, uh, is obvious. California State University Sacramento unveiled the mock-up of the Kuiwaka Flame of Hope monument, said to be raised on campus as part of the university's commitment to fighting genocide and preserving memory. The monument will be officially inaugurated April next year. Adam Squizera, RTV News. Now back to this region and Rwanda's Minister of Infrastructure, Dr. Jimmy Gasore, has attended the 16th Council of Ministers meeting and visited the regional Rusumo Falls hydroelectric project. The event brought together energy ministers from Rwanda, Tanzania and Burundi to review the progress and identify pathways for the smooth execution of the project. Meeting, the meeting that is deliberated on various agenda items, including reviewing matters arising from the 15th Council of Ministers meeting, receiving updates on projects implementation, and discussing the plan for the project's inauguration. The 80 megawatt regional Rusumo Falls hydroelectric power project, uh, which aims to increase the supply of electricity to the national grids of Burundi, Rwanda, and Tanzania, has registered tangible progress and is currently under the commissioning stage. We are very happy to see the progress I've seen today because we were here last time in uh, October last year and uh, at that time the progress was good but uh, there were only uh, one engine, one uh, power generating engine running. Today all the power plants, all the power engines are running and the power is being dispatched to all the three countries. So we are very pleased of the progress and uh, this is a very good benefit for our countries, for our people. Uh, in Rwanda, we are having additional 27 megawatts of power, and same to uh, all other countries. In addition, uh, we have also, the project has also contributed to social development in the respective district close to the project, and uh, hospitals, schools, have been constructed, even youth center in Chirehe district is being built uh, in this project. In addition, a job has been created during construction with the people from the three countries and um, additional jobs are also created for operation of the project, the, the facility. Dr. Jimmy Gasore, Rwanda's Minister of Infrastructure, speaking to Rwanda Television. Now moving on to the health sector, eye specialists here in Rwanda have emphasized that collaboration with other experts will enhance the quality and efficiency of eye care services in the country. On November the 15th, a training session on treating ocular trauma was conducted at Kabgai Hospital involving doctors from eight hospitals. This training utilizes advanced imaging equipment and requires stitching injured eyes with microscopic uh, sutures demanding precision. One group of doctors trained in Kabgai while another was in London sharing knowledge and techniques to treat injuries effectively. This is the first time such training has been conducted in Rwanda and the region with participants affirming that it equips them with cutting edge skills for managing complex eye injuries. Uh, training where we are doing some simulations on, on various trauma cases from cornea, from sclera so those are very helpful because we, we are learning from from people who are knowledgeable from UK so we are getting a lot of skills in terms of of trauma repairs in the eyes 
That was uh, Dr. Amani Fidel Mujisha, an ophthalmologist in Rugwa Magana. The technology aims to reduce delays between eye injury and treatment, which can otherwise worsen the condition, potentially leading to blindness. Um, so this course is done in collaboration with the Royal College of Ophthalmologists in London. So we have another group. Um, we have another group running the same course at the same time uh, via Zoom. Uh, from London at the same time, uh, but we each part will have their own uh, weight lab uh, session where they can practice on trauma eyes and um, enhance their knowledge and practice um, their skills on, on how to define their skills of better repairing uh, an eye with a trauma. Now using simulator, uh, simulation centers for training also saves hospital resources. Uh, sending one doctor to the UK for similar training would cost over 3 million London francs. This approach ensures skills transfer while optimizing costs. Now to business matters and the Rwanda Development Board has vowed to strengthen the one-stop center to minimize further the costs and time of providing services to investors and business leaders here in Rwanda. We have the details with William Evans Mutabazi. The commitment to strengthen the one-stop center to minimize further the cost and time of providing some of the services to investors was made by RDB's CEO Francis Katare during the CEO's forum in which business leaders and investors gathered to highlight challenges they face and together forge a way forward. Uh, we want to make sure that the one-stop center is strengthened because many of the government services that are offered uh, to you have now been brought together at the one-stop center at RDB. So you are going to begin to see uh, better uh, service provision at the one-stop center, uh, especially among all these regulators that were previously uh, uh, increasing the cost and delay uh, to some of your, uh, the services you are receiving at, at the one-stop center. We're also embarking on a, a, a quick digitization process so that many of these services can be online and less discretion from uh, individuals you are talking about and, 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 and you know, some automation uh, uh, will be done also. Business leaders and investors, especially those under the private sector, say they still face challenges that hinder or slow investment and have asked the government to intervene. The Minister of Trade and Industry says that the government has a responsibility to support the private sector and such forums are important because of that. We need to listen to them and their challenges so we can support them accordingly and together foster first economic development for our country. In more than 63.5 trillion million francs, which will be used to implement the National Strategy for Transformation, NST2, the private sector loan is required to contribute more than 27.3 trillion million francs, which is 43% of the total funds needed. William Evans. Mitavazi, RTV News. The Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Rwanda has urged members of governance boards in various government institu institutions to apply the principles of good governance. They have learned to serve the public effectively and improve financial management. This call was made during the certification ceremony for board members who completed training on providing sound guidance and oversight to the institutions they lead. The graduates expressed their commitment to applying the knowledge gained to enhance their service to citizens. Uh, when we'll be doing things that we have knowledge to back us up in the decisions that we'll be taking uh, in the, any work involved in the board. So I would say that uh, these courses that we've taken, uh, it was kind of directing and uh, realigning everything that we do in the board. Uh, backing us up with a proper knowledge, especially with an evolving uh, economy, evolving uh, technology. So, yeah. okay. this is equipping us with the knowledge that we need to carry out the responsibilities we have on the board. Previously, to appoint someone on the board, they take anyone without any formal training. But now, through the training, someone going to the board of the company will be able to manage the company in the interest of the stakeholders, including the general public and even the investors. So the company will be making more profit as long as it is managed in a way that responds to corporate governance. Uh, uh, the purpose of uh, today's event was uh, it was uh, 
a certificate award ceremony uh, to uh, all the people who have uh, undergone uh, the corporate uh, directorship program that uh, we've been running together with the Institute of Directors. Of yeah, of course, um, what we're expecting from these people who have uh, completed this program is for them to be able to add value to the boards on which they serve. Uh, because a lot of organizations, uh, you know, uh, as much as they're supposed to be making profit uh, or uh, they expected also to, to bring value uh, to, to the organizations. And uh, we hope that uh, these people, the skills that they have gained through the program, will be able to allow them to contribute in a more uh, positive way. Fifteen participants from different government institutions and ministries attended the training, but only nine successfully completed all of its modules. Now, Friday marked the official conclusion of the Quantum Project a partnership between the Korea Organization, uh, that is Korea International Cooperation Agency, COICA, and the Government of Rwanda, aimed at enhancing the quality of education in technical and vocational education training schools, or TVET schools as they are usually referred to. The project focused on revising curricula and training teachers to improve their teaching modules Launched in 2021, the project sought to build the capacity of Tibet teachers here in Rwanda. It leaves a lasting impact with nearly 2,500 teachers trained in lesson planning and delivery. Today we are very excited to uh, finally, you know, complete our TICUM project and then inaugurate to uh, this project and also the handover to the IP, finally, yeah. Uh, actually, the TICUM project is the, uh, the our the kind of last journey for enhancing the quality-based approach of the Tibet in Rwanda. So very, uh, it's uh, like uh, almost 15 years back, the COICA initiated the Tibet project from the uh, infrastructure investment. But the infrastructure is cannot ensure the quality services of the you know education in Tibet. That's why you know COICA recognized maybe the. Not only just curriculum, but also the teachers' training, and then also the capacity, the based the training is very important. So Tikkun project, the intervention covers not only just you know uh, VTC, but also TSS and then even IPRC. So all the level of the Tibet, you know, the school uh, has enhanced their curriculum, their teachers' training. Even you know the I want to emphasize the COICA's intervention, especially goes to the teachers' training. So because in Rwanda there is no such uh, the Tibet uh, training certificate. So throughout the ITTI's the uh, support, the many of the teachers they already know how to teach, how to prepare, how to assist the you know the uh, teachers. I mean the their you know students. So those kind of the journey you know uh, is really really remarkable. So COICA you know committed our the next journey uh, is from the uh, quality uh, quality based the uh, Tibet to the career path. The ones the teachers, I mean, once the students the graduate the, their school, they actually need to, you know, the ensure the good job. So COICA committed our next journey into the good quality of the you know graduate students the career path throughout the BTEC project. Yeah. In its first year since establishment, ICAD Africa State of the Art Surgical Training and Research Center has significantly enhanced the skills of Rwandan doctors as confirmed by the Ministry of Health. This advancement is contributing to improved healthcare services for patients across the country and beyond. We have the details with Olive Nete. In its first year of operation, ERCAD Africa has trained 382 doctors from 26 countries around the world through intensive three to five day surgical courses designed for practicing physicians. This year, the center also expanded its training to include nurses, recognizing their crucial role in surgical care. Dr. King Kayondo, president of ERCAD Africa, emphasized that offering these high quality training programs to healthcare professionals globally is a significant step toward addressing existing gaps in the healthcare sector. Nous avons pu uh, uh, faire uh, uh, plus de 15 cours. We have been able to conduct more than 15 courses and these are courses of a very high level. On the other hand, we are also conducting research on innovative projects. At this stage, we already have a very interesting project. 
we are working with our French colleagues on a revolutionary ultrasound probe. All these achievements are not just for the country, the benefits or the impact of ICAD Africa's presence in Rwanda extend to the entire African continent. So far, more than 26 countries have sent their surgeons or nurses not only from the continent of Africa but also from other countries across the world like Pakistan and Afghanistan who have sent nurses for training courses. I believe that ACAD Africa is making an impact not only in Rwanda but also across the African continent. L'ICAD Africa is en train de 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 mettre euh pas seulement au Rwanda mais aussi sur le continent africain. Dr. Claire Caritezi, a neurosurgeon who trained at ERCAD's center in France and now serves as ERCAD Africa's course co-director, highlights the impact of this specialized training. She notes that the skills gained through these courses enhance their expertise, enabling them to deliver faster and more effective surgical care to patients. Uh, usually, uh, mornings are dedicated to theoretical uh, learning, so they are in the auditorium learning about you know, the theory they are going to be practicing later in the labo laboratory room. Um, and then um, in the afternoon, uh, we have, de depending on which domain is you know, being explored, um, so you may have pigs or some uh, anatomical uh, uh, specimen. Uh, so um, you have maybe one, two, three days uh, like that, and then you have uh, evaluation every morning and at the end of the day, and an overall uh, evaluation of the course. So of course, um, having um, um, such courses prepare surgeons uh, to be ready uh, before they can go and practice on patient or you know, operate patient, live patient in their own hospitals because uh, learning in a lab is the closest way um, to perform surgery in a, you know, better simulation uh, scenario. So I'm a trained surgeon, but I still go to courses so I can master some of the new techniques or some advanced techniques. So it's very important for surgeons to, to do such trainings. Rwanda aims to become a medical hub for Africa, providing accessible high-quality healthcare services to both Rwandans and patients from across the continent. The establishment of IRCAD Africa marks a significant step towards achieving this vision. Dr. Atanas Rukundo, the Director General of Clinical and Public Health Services at the Ministry of Health, emphasized the goal of training every surgeon at IRCAD Africa to boost the number of skilled professionals capable of delivering high-quality surgical services across the country. Going forward, uh, we want to make sure that uh, our training programs, whether it's undergraduate, whether it's uh, postgraduate, with postgraduate I mean uh, specialization in surgeries, we want to make sure that uh, every uh, trainees are passing here to, you know, get, be exposed to these, you know, uh, tools, innovations, be part of this research, you know, drive, you know, the future we want in this healthcare uh, arena. And it's possible because we have, you know, the readership that has made this possible. We, we hope that uh, in the near future, we'll be able to have almost everyone trained uh, via settings like this one. It's not really only stopping here. We also want to make sure that, uh, you know, even the training institutions across the, the country have access to facilities like these ones. The Lancet Global Health reports that 5 billion people lack adequate access to surgical services, resulting in 10 million deaths annually due to unmet surgical needs. To bridge this gap, an estimated 1.7 million additional surgical clinicians are urgently required worldwide. Olive Nete, RTV News. Welcome back, and now a look at international news. Young Ugandans in the motorcycle, uh, that is motorcycle taxi industry, commonly known as border borders in that country, are adopting electric motorcycles thanks to a partnership between Gogo Electric, a Ugandan social enterprise, and uh, USAID's strategic investment activity. However, both Gogo Electric manufacturers and Border Border riders agree that more needs to be done to develop the eco-friendly technology in that country, particularly VOA has the details. 
In Uganda, motorcycle taxis, commonly known as border borders, are indispensable. It is estimated that there are over 500,000 motorcycle taxis in the country. Being able to access remote locations and effectively navigate through traffic jam, this affordable mode of transport is now going electric. Andrew Nyamhaki has been working in the border border industry for over five years. In the past 18 months, he has been riding an electric motorcycle. He says it is much cheaper to charge an electric motorcycle than it is to fuel a gasoline-powered one. The fuel, if you put uh, 8,500, sometimes you can, if you're riding a border border, you can make uh, like 20,000 on a fuel one. But for this electric one, when you, you charge once and you pay 8,500, you make around uh, 40,000 and uh, 50,000. With the production of 1,000 electric motorcycles so far, Gogo Electric, an electric motorcycle and battery manufacturing company, is transforming the transport industry while protecting the environment. Yanosh Bisaso, Chief Operations Officer, Gogo Electric, says cyclists using the electric batteries report reduced vibration and noise. This fuel-free technology contributes to cleaner air by cutting out almost two tons of carbon monoxide emissions per annum. According to Yanosh, Gogo Electric has to work to provide products that perform to riders' expectations with the right quality at the right price. We found that uh, acceptance and the ability for people to earn money on the motorcycle was, was the true test. And I think that was the true um, way to overcome the barrier to entry to adopt this new technology. Janosch points out that to provide this service, Gogo Electric partnered with USAID's strategic investment activity, SIA, that offered a business service through an investment program that enables the electric manufacturing company to reach out to funders. Amy Bila, Director, Economic Growth Office at USAID in Uganda, explains why they chose to work with Gogo Electric that employs over 400 young Ugandans. We were really happy to work with Gogo Electric as they're introducing new technologies into Uganda that will help reduce the impact of climate change by reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. It will also grow employment in the country. For the past 60 years, the U.S. government has been contributing to Uganda's economic development. But what is the future of electric vehicles in Uganda? In Uganda, we have a largely... I believe over 95% um, renewable um, powered grid and um, there are of course great opportunities around that in terms of utilizing uh, clean energy. Um, however, in terms of grid infrastructure it's also quite challenging because that power production um, is quite jagged. Riders like Andrew hope Gogo Electric will be able to expand its charging stations countrywide to make it even easier for them to move longer distances. Yonash says expansion will highly depend on the public's ability to fully embrace the technological revolution that can benefit all Ugandans. Ali Mahthmani for VA News, Kampala, Uganda. Now to the U.S., where after losing the White House to former President Donald Trump, Democrats are still searching to figure out what went wrong. Analysts say the economy played the biggest role in the party's losses and Vice President Kamala Harris's defeat, but other factors also contributed, as VOA tells us once more. As Democrats come to terms with their general election losses, they are also searching for answers to explain their defeat. The White House has pushed back on the notion that President Joe Biden's bid for re-election and his hesitancy to withdraw from the presidential race earlier hurt Vice President Kamala Harris's chances of winning. When he made that decision uh, to hand over the torch, pass the torch to the vice president, he believed it was the right decision to make at that time. Harris's inability to set herself apart from Biden's economic policies hurt her presidential bid the most, analysts say. The popular perception was that he had not been a good steward of the economy, which, you know, as I said, mostly stemmed from the sharp inflation of his first two years in office. And I think those were very difficult obstacles for Harris to overcome. Stand up like that! 
On the campaign trail, great attention was paid to abortion rights. But women didn't vote for Harris on that issue at the rate Democrats had hoped for. There were a lot of states that had a referendum referenda on the ballot to codify reproductive rights, so people were able to vote for that and at the same time vote for Trump. Democratic strategist Julie Roginski says that beyond assessing this election cycle's mishaps, the Democratic Party needs to fix what she calls a long-standing structural problem. We have a record to be proud of, and yet we don't know how to communicate it. We don't come across as authentic. Fresh blood could prove re-energizing, says John Lappy, an associate professor of political science at Plymouth State University. They need new leadership that is younger and more in tune with conditions now and definitely more in tune with the working class. Since Republicans hold just a slim majority in Congress, Lappy expects Democrats will be able to push back on policies they disagree with while they await their next shot in the 2026 midterm elections. Veronica Valderas Iglesias, VOA News, Washington. That report brings us to the end of this edition. However, before we go, let us once again take a look at the headlines. The results of the 2023-2024 academic year secondary school leaving national examinations have been announced here in Rwanda. Rwanda's Minister of Infrastructure has attended the 16th Council of Ministers meeting and visited the regional Rusumo Falls hydroelectric project. And as we just saw, after losing the White House to former President Donald Trump, Democrats in the U.S. are now soul-searching to figure out what went wrong. As usual, I wish you all the best as we begin the weekend and I'll be seeing you soon again. Thank you for joining us and goodbye.